Amen. Okay, thank you, Bishop. Appreciate that. And good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Seven Cities Forums of Hampton Roads presents Portsmouth Coffee Talk. Looks like I'm frozen there, but anyway, I hope you can hear me. Portsmouth Coffee Talk. And we're here. My name is James Slim Overton, and I'm here with our host, Leah Drake Stith and Thomas the Colonel Chapman. And we have to introduce a new guest host, Roderick Hawthorne. And he, we've added us, added us, added him to uh, our team. And he, you'll see a lot of him on here. And we, you know, wanted to have a little younger perspective of what's going on. And we figured, what a better time to add him on is during Black History Month. And we're gonna today, this morning, we're gonna share some about some of our experiences as far as black history is concerned some of our personal experiences or whatever the host wants to talk about what they, they want to contribute and roger will do that as well so good morning host how's everybody good morning good morning, good morning. how's everyone today yes and before we get started with that um uh, maybe leah you can uh we have a bit of news concerning our guest host here maybe you can expound on that yes what an amazing time doing black history month my son my very own roderick hawthorne has his first vote cover let's congratulate roderick on a job well done this is the first of many roderick now roderick, so. when i say that this is your first vote cover Explain, is it because it is your model? Explain to us exactly what that entails. And, and Rob, so, before you do that, let the Colonel do his dis disclaimer. I forgot to do that. You get that? Uh, yes. The, uh, and let's give this disclaimer first. Thanks, Slim. Uh, the, uh, the views stated on this program are the guests and if we and the hosts uh, and nobody else. So we keep us out of Facebook jail and go on and not the radio station also put that in there so go ahead um yeah so the this being my first vogue cover is the first vogue cover that i casted as a casting director um i'm the one who went out and found the talent i booked the talent um for this job they asked me to do it um and it is the first one that i've casted in my career very good. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And, and if I was computer savvy, I could have shared that on my screen. And I'm going to get there. <laughs> I'm going to get there. Okay. <laughs> my phone up to the screen. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. Yes, that's the that's his vote cover there, everybody. That's Roderick Hawthorne's vote cover during this Black History Month. Congratulations once again, Roderick. Congratulations. Yes, before Roger goes again, I think uh, we're doing the Grammys last night. Didn't we have a representative from Portsmouth to win a Grammy? Did, yes, did, he, is a, he is a 2004 graduate of IC Norcom High School. He marched in the band uh, a year before I came in. He graduated in 2004, um, and he played trumpet at Norcom's, in Norcom's band. He is now the assistant band director at Tennessee State University. They won their first Grammy last night, and it is the first time a marching band has ever won a Grammy in history. Hmm. Yeah. And he was a legacy, too, because his dad graduated in 78, I believe. I see no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was a legacy Greyhound. So that was good to see that. I, I didn't watch the Grammys, but I saw that pop up <laughs> that we had a, a Narcom grad to uh, win a Grammy. Uh, I think he is Dr. Knight's nephew. Oh, wow. Even more connection there. <laughs> yep. Like my shirt says, I am Black History. We are Black History. Every day we uh, we're making Black, Black History, history. 24-7, <laughs> 365 days. Yes, yes. indeed. I'm so, not relegated to just February, okay? <laughs> so, Roger, since you're, since you're the new member of the team here, we want to start with you. Uh, just wanted to ask you, because I, I had a roommate that went into modeling right after in the 70s, and he talked to me about all the, the uh, everything he faced as a model. You know, uh, if they had one model already, he would go in, they say, we already have one. Uh, all the black models had to be clean shaven because they were considered 
uh, intimidating with a mustache or a beard. And they went through that, but that was then. So, and that was the modeling agency. But in your field, once you start getting into what you're doing, uh, what did you see any kind of obstacles, um, you know, that you had to deal with? Or was it, did the people before you pave the way and made it much easier for you? Um, I would say there are definitely people um, like Andre Leon Talley, who was the first uh, Black creative director at Vogue, um, at U.S. Vogue. Um, he really opened the door um, for Black editors to come in. Um, he would spend summers with Carl Lagerfeld. He uh he was he first worked under um what is his name uh he was an artist uh in new york and he really he is to me the epitome of what black excellence was in fashion at the time because there was literally no one else in the industry that was doing what he was doing he was best friends with Diane Freeland, who at the time was, she used to be a Vogue editor in chief, and then she ended up being the curator and runner of the Met um, in New York. And he, she helped get him his first job um, at a, a magazine before he went to Vogue. He really opened the door for every other black person that came after him. Um, in the industry, but I will say it took a very long time for even other black creatives to really open the door and, and, and get their feet wet in the industry. Um, it's always been a struggle for um, black talent, as well as black creatives uh, to work in the industry, even though we have always been the ones that are the culture, we move culture forward, we have always been um, the ones that do that, everyone follows our lead, even though they don't give us the credit for it. Um, so, you know, it's it's been like that for some time, but I will say, you know, there's still obstacles um, in the industry, especially with respect to um, Black models and models still struggling to have their hair properly done. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, nowadays, even in the industry now, a lot of agencies and or brands want girls that are either straight from the motherland or they're light skinned with curly hair. Mm. It is very hard to push African-American women that are actually from the United States forward because they want girls that are coming straight from Africa that look exotic, in their mind, exotic. Um, and then you have, you know, hairstylists, they call themselves hairstylists that don't know how to do black hair. And a lot of girls' hair are getting mess, messed up and damaged. I had a girl who I was managing who was a Louis Vuitton exclusive for three seasons. And <clears throat> her relaunch of her career, she, she uh, walked from uh, St. Laurent. And when she did this show in Paris, we were at the show, and they damaged her hair. They burned her hair. She had to cut all of her hair off. And she had an afro that came out to here. Mm. Her hair was this small by the time she had to cut her hair off because all of her curl pattern was damaged. And that came from hairstylists not knowing how to do black hair. And I just never could understand how you could be a call, your, call yourself a hairstylist and not, have, and not know how to do all texture with hair. Because if you are a black hairstylist, you have to know how to do all textures of hair. But as white hairstylists, they are not, it's not something that's required for them when they go through school. And if they, even if it is, they don't have that much experience with doing it. So, you know, those are some of the disparities that we still face in the industry as black creators. Yeah, I'm glad you bring that to us because as, as you think about black history, it's a wide spectrum of, of what we have to deal with or what we had to deal with. You know, a lot of people know about the civil rights movement and things like that, but we're all over the place in different uh, fields and occupations. 
and uh, the people in those different fields and occupations go through or have gone through some things too. So glad to have you here to give that perspective in that field because a lot of people don't know what some of the things the people in your field had to go through as as models or designers or whatever, and maybe still going through. So They're still going glad through. to have you here to, to share that and other things that you have to share. Absolutely. Um, Let's go to our other hosts, and uh, I, I don't know whatever you, however you want to share your experiences with Black history. Uh, it could be local, uh, and Leah, you have your experiences. You know, uh, but we won't talk about the dolphins this time because they are. Um, yeah. <laughs> Get that part about, of black, black history. Yeah, we talk about <laughs> animal world. We're we'll getting into the dolphins. You swim with the dolphins. <laughs> you made a lot of trips to Africa and, and you know abroad, and I, I don't know if you want to start there locally, but uh... okay. Um, I guess I will start then with um, my trip to Ghana. Um, uh, that trip to Ghana was uh, an eye opener. I, I always wanted to go to Africa. Uh, that's, I knew that was our roots. I knew that was our beginnings. And I especially wanted to go to the West Coast of Africa. And um, when I, on that trip to Ghana, one of the chief took all of those, us who had come there, he told us that he was gonna give us the names that we should have had before we left the motherland. He came and he sat down with us and he chatted with us. And uh, he told us to meet him at dawn at the, at the water. We met him at dawn at the water. And he said, these are the names that you should have had before you left the motherland. He said, there's one thing that I want you to always remember. I always, he gave us a drink of water. He said, this is water. He then gave us a drink of wine. He said, this is wine. He said, I want you to always be able to know the difference between wine and water. He says, and because if those things that you don't know, you're confused about. And it's the same thing with your history. If you don't know your history, you're confused. So he gave me the name Afua Ajiawa, female born on a Friday with the strength and vitality of an eagle. I love that name and I, I embrace that name. And um, it was a time when we, we got to go to the slave castles and, and we got to see uh, what, and, and, and my impetus really for going was, I had gone to see the movie Sankofa and um, to see what she went through and as she made her movement through the slave castle. Well, when I, when I was at the slave castle in Ghana, uh, at that time, the electricity may be on for six hours, off for six hours, you know, you just didn't know when it was gonna hit. And uh, just as we got into this, I, I thought about the, the movement of this actress as she went through that slave castle, Elmino Castle in, in, in Ghana. And when we got there, the lights went out. So therefore we didn't have any, any lights. So it's, it's almost you experienced going through the castle, sort of like what was experienced by those who went before us. The only thing is that we had on shoes. They didn't mm -hmm. have shoes on. And, 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 the, and the, the, the rocky uncertainness of the ground was just unbelievable. And, and, and the, the smells, it was just like you could smell the ancestors as you uh, went through through the uh, slave castle there in Ghana. And I also had the experience of going to Goreal, to the door of no return, and that's in Senegal. And um, there um, you can imagine what they may have felt when you've been on this land all your life and you go into the slave castle and when you look out of that door of no return mm -hmm. and you see nothing but ocean. And you cannot imagine what they may have thought as they looked through that door, not knowing where they were going, not knowing what was going to take place in their lives. That's why many of them kill themselves. You know, they tried to put rocks in their mouths, trying to, to, to kill themselves, trying to commit suicide, because they didn't know what they were going to experience once they left the slave castle. They also had a room that they called the recalcitrant room. And that was a room, a small room, where they kept those that they could not control. And the room was so small, you had to bend over to get down into that room. And they would put them there in that room uh, to, to wear them down so that they can control them. Uh, 
<clears throat> at some point in time and 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 they used to drink the rainwater as the rainwater came from the ceilings and many of them died because of the rodents that were on top of the ceiling so it's just the the hard life and the hardships that uh, that those uh, who uh, did come to this country uh, from those African countries, what they experienced prior to uh, being placed on those slave ships. It, it, was, it was quite an experience. Uh, and I do recommend if anybody goes to go to Africa, you got to do the West Coast of Africa first and foremost. I mean, I went to South Africa too. South Africa is beautiful, but our history is located on the West Coast of Africa. And always, I thought that my family was from Sierra Leone. For years, I told people, because my mother's from Beaufort, my father's from Georgia, the seacoast of Georgia. And I always told people that we were from Sierra Leone because the president of Sierra Leone came to Beaufort, South Carolina, and was able to have a conversation with the people in Beaufort using his language and them using the Gullah language. They could communicate with each other. But however, upon doing my DNA, I found out my family is not from Sierra Leone. My family is from Cameroon. One other thing, and I'm gonna let y'all, I'm gonna say one other thing. Every place I have gone in Africa, West Coast, South Africa, everybody always told me, say, girl, you Nigerian. I said, oh, no, 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 no. My family is from Sierra Leone. Girl, you Nigerian. No, no, no. My family is from Sierra Leone. I get my DNA back and my family is from Cameroon, which used to be a part of Nigeria. So, so it's just amazing how they can kind of look at you and kind of say, hmm, yeah, I know where you're from. I know what tribe you may have been a part of. And each time they were right because I am a descendant of those from Cameroon who was a part of Nigeria. So, uh, it's just it's just such an amazing experience to have, really. You know, Leah, I, I haven't talked to anyone that has made that trip where that experience hadn't changed their lives, you know, when they come back and talk about it. So that's amazing. Colonel, you know, uh, and we're going to talk about everything, but I, I'm sort of going with everybody's strengths right now. Uh, you spent extensive time in the military. And I, I guess, I don't know, when you went in, I guess it was uh, the early mid seventies and, and your father had been in before. And we all know the, the stories about um, our fellow military people that went in and came back and fought and came back and was disrespected. During the time you went in, what did you see? Uh, I, I know you benefited from some of the things, you know, your predecessors went through, but uh, what did you actually experience? Because I knew some things were still sort of lingering on and maybe today as well. Well, let me, let me start first is uh, for those out there in electron lands. Uh, this program and programs that we put on or you are not going to hear it anywhere else in America, especially now <laughs> as uh, forces of evil have, are trying to uh, whitewash our histories and to uh, erase our history, our collective history. And, and so if you'd like to these programs to continue and also to expand, you can send an honorarium or a uh, or donation to Portsmouth Coffee Talk, P.O. Box 7664, Portsmouth, Virginia 23707. And uh, everything, 100% of the uh, proceeds and donations that we gather, I mean, 100% goes back into expanding and keeping us on air and keeping us on uh, other mediums as we speak. And we also have a Zelle app and some other ways to get money. And uh, Slim will tell you about that. Go ahead and hit that right Yeah, the there. Zelle is um, Postman Coffee Talk at yahoo.com. And our cash app is dollar sign PCT1220. Mm -hmm. Please support us. Yes. Okay. And yeah, so I will go back to when I uh I, I go back to see my my grandfather who uh in back in the services when he was there, you know, the only really ratings or jobs that you could do was uh uh either working in the kitchen or bolson mate or whatever, just a nondescript job for people in the Navy. Uh my dad 
uh, when he uh, joined the Navy, came through, and there wasn't too many people that looked like him that was were not just working in the uh, kitchen. And he was the uh, the second uh, African American uh, person to uh, graduate from radar school in the Navy. And I believe the first person never worked in the job, but he was a graduate of it. So my dad was really the first radar man in the Navy, uh, a black person in the Navy. And so fast forward, when I joined the army first time, I went in as a dental technician, did my three and a half years, and it did open my eyes to a lot of things that, uh, and the possibilities, and I think the services do that for young folks. It opens up your eyes for uh, possibilities of what can be achieved uh, through hard work and dedication and keeping your eye on the prize. And so I did my three and a half years, got out, went to North State, and I'm giving you a chronological little quick one hit right quick. But I went into nursing, graduated there in 1981, 82, somewhere in there. But at the time, uh, they want being a black male in uh nursing was not a uh considered a viable career, and this is during the uh recession back there in the Carter administration, I believe so. And but the thing is, uh, I made good money, and I actually, uh, to tell you the truth, I was the first black male uh nurse at Maryview Hospital. And uh, it was a sign of respect because one, I had a professional degree. I did very, very well. Could have stayed there in that. But I also saw by using what my parents instilled in me and also with, also with the military saying I needed more. So I went on to Hampton, graduated, got my BSN, went back into the service and stayed another 30 years. So, uh, and then, making uh and retired as a uh, uh um a colonel but racism and i and i will say it was uh lack of the opportunity especially amongst black folks uh it took a hundred and i think 12 either 14 years before i made uh they saw me go across the, the, the threshold for colonel which only, I was only the seventh African-American uh, male to make 06 in the Army Nurse Corps, which to me is an indictment of American history. And I say American history because Black American history or uh, or Black History Month that we, we uh, are celebrating this month is American history. And we go back to the days where in the beginning, uh, this Black History Month that we celebrate now is back like really called, used to be called Negro History Week mm -hmm. in uh, 19, oh yeah, and we're going to make this transition in five minutes here, but I'm just going to get this across right here by mm -hmm. uh, uh, Carter uh, G. Woodson way back in the day. And so uh, I actually this read that in a Norcom yearbook uh, yeah. last night. Oh yeah, they, ce they celebrated Black History, Negro History Week at the yeah. school, mm -hmm. and this is part of history that uh, or they're trying to wipe out. So uh, let me let Slim go ahead and talk about the transition before I, I get off this long diatribe. <laughs> I yes, thanks, son. and we'll be closing out the radio section of this uh, broadcast at seven o'clock. And want to thank all the listeners on WGPL thirteen fifty for listening to us uh, this morning and. Should be sure to come back next Monday for another show. And we'll be transitioning to Facebook only. So if you're listening on the radio and you want to continue to hear us, switch to Leah Stitt's Facebook page and continue to listen and watch. Mm -hmm. But you know what? And, and I'll go back to modern times. And I, I always like politics and love politics. And I guess in my afterlife, if I was... Uh, father Hindu, I'd come back as a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> because one, if you look at now you, your Confederate governor that we allowed in, I'm saying we allowed in because we sat home and <clears throat> allowed this Confederate governor to be here. The only thing he talks about is, is changing the educational standards 
in America, in, in, in uh, the state of Virginia, to whitewash our history. Talks about CRT training. Remember, he came, him sent down his uh, attorney general. He came down here and gave a uh, the, what I call the hucklebuck speech to a lot of black preachers here in the town and to the city council. Talking about they are going to send help and going to help us with crime in America. Look, where's what have they done? What have they done? Jack. <laughs> uh, and I, and I, I use a, a good word, and I just say Jack. And for those who are listening, you know what Jack, what I want to say, the real word is what Jack means. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> we, we have to, uh, as a people, uh, wake up. And we've given back throughout, when we're talking about Black history, uh, with the Voting Rights Act, we have given back, back our only power that we have by not voting and staying home. Uh, and this is across America. We'll get out there and protest when one of these uh, white policemen uh, actually lynches or shoots down and murders a Black person. We'll get out there and, uh, and, and march. And I know I'm going off on another tangent here. Well, we'll march till the cows come home. But if I do a raise of hand, probably only 30% of those folks who are of voting age are registered to vote and show up at the polls. So for my own opinion, we deserve what we get. Especially <laughs> when we have low voter turnout. Mm -hmm. So uh, before I get back on this, I, I get back to it. And I, I could talk about my own career, but I don't want it to be fun, uh, centered on the uh, racial prejudice and the struggles that I went through and I could go back to when I, I remember going, uh, walking through Academy Park when Martin Luther King got killed, where they tried to run us over, my brother and I, uh, they tried to run us over uh, in Academy Park just because we were Black. And it goes on and on and on. But I, I'll go on from there and I, I'll get you back in there, Slim, because I know you want to say, cut me off and keep going. <laughs> Now I'll just say um, I think we we could do a whole show on on Black history as far as um, our um, people fighting in, in all the different wars. I mean, we contribute in every war they were starting from the Revolutionary War up until today. So we could do a whole story on the military and Black history, and hopefully we'll get a chance to do that. Now, I just want to say we ahead. are in a war now in a for our own survival here, right here in America. Let me. Uh, cut you off. Just not Black history in 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 the military. We are in a war now, right here, where uh, many Blacks in this country, or well, most Blacks, uh, you will lose your life, have a po higher possibility of than your white counterparts of losing your life just by having a five dollar light bulb broken in your tail light. And I'll say that right there. Yeah, definitely true. Definitely true. And I just want to say that, um, you know, listening to Liam and, and yourself, Colonel, and Roderick, and, uh, how important it is, you know, if we talk about Black history, is the family to be in, in, involved in, in, our, in their children growing up, especially when you have people that are making policies to uh, keep that history from us. You know, it's important, just like over in Africa, the way they used to pass down history, they would sit around in a circle and right. the elders would pass down the history and then it would continue and continue. You know, no books, it just put it in your head and mm -hmm. see. And we need to do that here because I can remember and uh, Colonel and, and Leah, you might remember us on Saturday mornings watching cartoons, how racist those cartoons mm -hmm. were being. Anytime they uh, showed a black person, he was big lips, bone in his mm -hmm. nose. Mm -hmm. Of course, they, there was Tarzan, you know, a white man who goes to Africa and mm -hmm. rules the people that live there. <laughs> they grew up there. Lived there all their lives. <laughs> right. And, and if we didn't have, or I can speak for myself, I didn't have <laughs> my parents or my father to sort of, you know, instill real history in me while I was sitting there enjoying and laughing at those those cartoons that uh that would have been what I would see that that would have been the image that would be in my mind about my own people and mm -hmm. I, and I'll just say quickly I saw a video a few days ago of a professor at a university and it's been taken down now so I won't mention any names and I don't know if it was real or there was something that they staged 
but she was talking to one of her students who had a Jamaican father and an African, a black mother, but she classified herself as white mm -hmm. and is in the process of bleaching her skin. And mm -hmm. I don't know if it's for, for real, but or, or it was staged, but her reason. Oh, I saw that you saw somebody that? being alive. I think it was Julia Boykins. Indeed it was, indeed it was. And she's known for, for having her students on camera with their permission talking mm -hmm. about some of their issues. And the young lady said her experience coming to an HBCU kind of was changed. Well, it wasn't changing how she felt about identifying as white and bleaching her skin, but some of the things she's learned since she's been there, uh, she did not know about her own people. And uh, it gives me pause. You know, she had parents that were black and, and they weren't sharing the information. So whether it was real or not, I think the message was that, you know, uh, like, like I was saying when I first started out, some things have to start at, at home. You know, uh, mm -hmm. it's a mm -hmm. single parent. You know, if, if you're a single parent, you got uncles, you got cousins, you got, it, it has to be a, a village. And we talk about that village concept and, and how it's broken now. But, mm -hmm. uh, that you know, but it has to be something that starts in that home. And then, you know, as you go along with your education, you know, that's to sort of add to it. So that was my thing. It was just amazing thinking about those cartoons that we used to watch and how, you know, you, you all remember how racist, and we didn't think nothing of it, but we laughing at it. And mm -hmm, if we mm -hmm. would see it now, we probably would be appalled. I mean, we <laughs> we want to write the station um, and, and get them to take it down. You know, even the little rascals where, we saw Stein, <laughs> you know, uh, Buck yes, and Buckwheat and, and Amos things. and Andy, and uh, <laughs> and they were actually Amos and Andy. They were actually holding their own against those white. Mm -hmm. you know, but, mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of degrading, you know, when you think about it. Uh, we were glad to see blacks on the screen, but the way they were portrayed, you know, could really mess up a young mind. And uh, right. thank God, like I said, we had family members or had parents that was telling us the real history of ourselves or, or creating uh, self-worth, you know, within ourselves. So. But, you know, it once again, it's incumbent upon each of us to um, teach our children. Uh, we cannot rely on public education to teach our children their history. It's important. I make sure that my children, that's why I say, we celebrate Black history in my family 24-7, 365 days. We are not relegated to our Black History Month. I made sure that my children and my grandchildren had an experience uh, as far as who they are and whose they are. I mean, not only just sitting down and talking to them and sharing them with history, but giving them the opportunity to go and taste and see and touch history. It's important that kids be able to see history you know, when I worked for the Pines and I traveled extensively for the Pines and I used to see uh, the uh, whites who took their kids out of school and had their kids at Mount Rushmore, had their kids at the Grand Canyon, had their kids at all the historical sites. So naturally when those kids were tested, it was easy for them to, to test out because they had seen it, they had touched it, they'd been a part of it. And that's why it was important for me. Uh, I told you about my trip uh, to Ghana when the chief gave me a carving of a Sankofa bird. And he told me, he said, you must go back and you must teach your children their history. You must teach your children to look at their entire history. Don't whitewash it, don't take anything away, but learn everything about it. Learn the good, learn the bad, learn the ugly, but you take the best of that that you learned, bring that to the present, so that you can go forth into the future. They said, the only way you can do this is by learning and appreciating your history. You cannot be successful. And that was the, the, the impetus that the man was putting behind the wine and the water. He says, because don't let no man confuse you in believing wine is water, water is fine. Don't let no man confuse you because you don't know your history. You know, I came back mm -hmm. and started Sankofa in 1997, working with kids in the community and taking them to uh, Alabama, 
taking them to 16th Street Baptist Church, taking them to march across the Pettus Bridge to the Whitney Plantation. And, and, and one little cute thing, when I took my kids to the Whitney Plantation in Louisiana, one of my little girls says, Miss Death, I think I'd like to have a beignet. I said, what do you know about a beignet? You know, I mean, well, how do you know about this? Well, she had seen it on a princess and a frog. So I had the driver to take us off of the main drag, take us into New Orleans, have them to sit down to a good New Orleans meal in a New Orleans restaurant, and they got to go to eat that beignet. So, you know, we got to expose our children more. Our children, our children are not exposed. You know, one time schools took you on trips. Schools don't take kids on trips anymore. But then the trips that they took us on, the people told us lies. And we allowed the people to tell our kids lies about Jamestown and Williamsburg. We allowed them to tell them lies that all of these people were slaves and, and these people. And you have more free people in Williamsburg than you had slaves, Blacks. You know, so we allowed people to, um, to tell the lies. I know I took my youth group to Williamsburg back in 1997 and we were put out of the, the tour because I told the lady, I said, you're not speaking the truth to these children. You need to tell them the truth. And she asked us to, to leave the tour because the things that she was saying was just not true. And then shortly after that, of course, Williams, Williamsburg got the other side. They got the other side of history where they start displaying what took place actually in black lives as free people in Williamsburg back during that time. So it's important that we teach our children. It's also important that we expose our children. Yeah, well, I, 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 think I think that's something that actually should be taught um, in school. I think African-American history is essential for not only just black people and black students, but for all races, colors and creeds because they need to understand that the United States was not just built by our white counterparts. It was literally built on the backs of our ancestors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they need to understand the contributions that we as a people have made to this society. Um, I say it all the time, you know, when it's hot in the summertime, I say, thank God for the black man that made the AC. Because we will all be hot. <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure that, that's for sure you know what and the other thing too we have to also understand that the the, the discussions now are uh, talking about uh, uh whitewashing history is uh in um uh, in especially down in uh, in uh the governor of florida the basis of that policy is white uh, whitewashing uh african-american studies is rooted in and across this nation is rooted in a deep seated uh, roots of racism that 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 goes back two hundred years, and uh, we have to call it out like it is. And I see the politicians and some of the pundits on TV or try to whitewash it and try to put in, you know, saying that you know this is what he wants to do. But you have to call out racism for what it is. Those folks are, that espouse this CRT training and uh, what's it all about, they don't even know what CRT is. <laughs> if you ask them, they couldn't tell you. They couldn't explain it to you. <laughs> they can't explain it. But you also have to say, yes, you two are a racist. And we have to separate them and know where we have to fight. And I think that, you know, as they were talking about it. Um, there's actually a documentary on Netflix um, talking about uh, the chronicles of racism in America. And he, at the end of his uh, speech of him talking about racism, he basically breaks down how the United States was formed on white supremacy. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if it was formed on white supremacy and people always say, well, we, we got to fix the system. No, the system is working Exactly just how like it was they exactly just like they planned it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> it's nothing that we can do as far as, you know, changing the system more so than, you know, people need to be taught the truth. And until the United States can face its own truth and its own harsh reality and take accountability for what has happened, 
we will continue to be in this vicious cycle mm -hmm. until kingdom come. Mm -hmm. and, and I think one of the other things, especially for our young people, uh, need to know that you know their everyday existence is also creating history going forward. And a lot of times you, you can help yourself by controlling the narrative, what you do. Take the situation in, in church and high school where the the uh, the, the uh, assistant coach played in the game. Uh, it's a lot of people to blame for that because a lot of people knew. knew. Exactly. You have exactly. to, you know, but see how far that story went all over, you know, the, the it news. It became viral. Yeah. Oh, well, Jimmy Fallon yeah. everywhere. Yeah. So now that's a part of Black history. But mm -hmm. do we want that kind of narrative out there? And that's that's all I'm saying. We can control. You have to realize that what you're doing today could be a part of Black history going forward. So I'm not saying don't get out there and have a good time and enjoy yourself, but be conscious of what you do because exactly. you could be exactly. making Black history and you want to make it in a way that is positive for the people ahead of, I mean, uh, yeah, the, the people that are going to be coming behind you. Um, mm -hmm. So control that narrative. And, you know, the, so those people, if you see a situation like that, students, you know, you have to speak up because a lot of people knew that that lady was playing in that game. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, uh, and that's, you know, some things are jokes, but that wasn't a joke and see what it got you. You know, everybody's fired and the, the season is over for, you know, for the team. So the ramifications of that one little act affected a lot of people. What about those other players? Mm -hmm. You know, that's going to lose the second half of uh, their their uh, playing season, you mm -hmm. know, when colleges are, are looking at them, you know, so. Yes. And, then, and you're talking about the, and the kids, they, their uh, collegiate careers are tainted forever. Mm -hmm. They'll always be tied to uh, that incident, that act, that incident. And so that is wrong. And I think, uh, Ro and I'll go back to what Roger was saying earlier, is saying that, uh, one, we're talking about the, the mm -hmm. starting of American history and how our country was formed. It was, it, we tie back to the slave trade, to our, uh, the industrial complex of the, the tobacco trade. We need, you know, they needed slaves to pick that cotton and also, uh, to cure that and to grow tobacco, what was the number one and two crops that we had out there. So we, they needed slaves. And fast forward to, to the days uh, with the anti-union uh, movement across the country. Uh, you work in these non-union shops in these in South Carolina, Tennessee or whatever, in Alabama, you know, for, uh, for the auto industry, you basically work in for lower wages, no hardly no benefits, but you got a little small check. But uh, you are basically a slave in the, in the context of a slave to the industrial complex out there because you know you can't see that what the benefits of a what a union mm -hmm. could bring to you with uh, better uh, pay, benefits, and retirement. And but it also goes back to also when you look at the policies that they put out. We was talking about uh, uh, the commercials and stuff like that, and the, and and the TV shows that we grew up with that we didn't know, you know, at the time uh, that were uh, uh, were racist. You look at the first George Bush uh, when he uh, actually. Well, I'll go back to when uh, Lyndon B. Johnson. Uh, put uh, Thurgood Marshall on the Supreme Court, first African-American appointed to the Supreme Court. So when he passed on, the first pull, George Bush, put uh, Clarence uh, Thomas on there. <laughs> and you know what his statement was behind there? Let them liberals, liberals uh, vote against this guy because they knew that this guy was not Black. He was only Black in skin. And so I, I, I uh, celebrate Joe Biden for putting what I call the second black person on the Supreme Court, Justice uh, Katanji uh, Brown. Brown. Katanji Jackson. Brown. Yeah. Yes. Which of them? Yes. Both Jackson both. Brown. 
Brown Jackson. Brown Jackson. <laughs> History. Can't get any blacker than that. How about that? <laughs> yeah, history, history shouldn't even uh, count. Uh, you know that that uh, sexist Joker uh, that replaced uh, uh, Justice Marshall, and that goes back to those policies and how they fool us all the time. And so, yes. So, what say you? I'll go up. They've done a great job at. Uh, being a, a wolf in sheep's clothes. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's just, just as you, as you think back on our history and you think back of all that we've gone through, all that we had to endure. But you know, my whole reflection goes back to many died, but your ancestors did not. You know, they went through the struggle they withstood all of the hardship that was placed against them and they still maintained and they still existed. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we are strong people. And if we reach back and understand who we are, we will realize where our strength lies. You know, I remember as a child, my father would take us to South Carolina. We had to go to South Carolina every summer. And um, at driving, to South Carolina, of course you packed your food because you couldn't stop at restaurants to, to purchase food. I mean, you could, but you had to go to the back. And, and my father was so proud, he was not going to the back anywhere. And uh, so we packed our food uh, to, to prepare for the trip uh, down to South Carolina. And along that trip, every time it seems we would get to Fayetteville, North Carolina, we would see uh, a cross burning episode taking place, you know, and, um, and, and, and I think, I thank my parents because they talked to us about our history. You know, they shared with us. My grandmother lived to be 105, my father's mother, and they used to do the slave shout songs, you know? And she used to, and every time we would go down to Georgia, we, my, my, my cousins were a part of the Macintosh shouters from, from the seacoast of, of Georgia. And she would share the stories of the plantation life because she was just a little kid when 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 um, it ended when slavery ended. She was just a little kid, and so she would sing the slave shout songs. And amazingly enough, although my parents tried to teach us, she used to try to teach the slave shout songs. But we, you know how we think that we have evolved, that we don't want a part of this. We don't we don't want to hear this. We don't want to be a part of this. But I wish so much now that I had taken the time truly to learn and to listen more closely to those things that she shared with us uh, because it would have better prepared me for some of the challenges that, that I faced later on. You know, I was the youth president of the NAACP when we marched on the YMCA in downtown Portsmouth because we couldn't go, blacks couldn't go there and white guys sitting on the steps of that YMCA throwing raw eggs at us, but we were taught nonviolence. You know, we were taught by the best, uh, those in the leadership in the NAACP about nonviolence. So, you know, um, we experienced the, the, the colored toilets and, and, and the white toilets, the colored water, water fountain and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the white water fountain, you know, so, um, but th those experiences that have been um, embedded within me and I guess that was the impetus that I used to help me to know that um, I got to I got to work with our kids. Our kids must know. They must know their history. That just shows, shows you the difference of, in our parental training compared to some white parental training. Uh, the, <laughs> the resistance, you know, that you all went through because who was more Christian, us or the ones that were <laughs> Claim to be Christian. Claim to be. I just wanted to get this point in because I know Leah has to make a hard exit. But uh, as we talk about police and, and what they're doing now, uh, the first patrolman in the city of Portsmouth was named John Wilson. Yeah. And if you read all the reports about the incidents that he was killed doing a, what they call it, a uh, conservative party of Portsmouth March. Mm -hmm. And he was shot and killed because they are saying that few whites got drunk, you know, that was their excuse. They got drunk and so they shot him. Uh, 
the word we got in the community that was passed down, it was a Klan rally. Yes, exactly. That's exactly. What it was. And during that time, the black patrolmen, if I'm not mistaken, I read it somewhere else, they didn't allow them to carry guns. No, they couldn't carry guns. You're yeah, right. And, uh, 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 and the event that was happening, fight or whatever, without a gun. But the people that he was trying to intervene in, they all had guns. Mm -hmm. That's how he was killed. So it's important that we know the, the true history. And mm -hmm. a lot of times that true history can only come through our communities, through us, from us. Exactly. To us. But the history shows in this particular article I'm reading, it's, it's kind of whitewashed. My, uh, my mom always said that. When the day comes for white people as a people to have their judgment for the atrocities that they have created on this earth, it will bust hell wide open. <laughs> Indeed it will. Indeed it will. Indeed it will. Indeed it will. Uh, and it will take from now until eternity for them to <laughs> to tell that story, all the atrocities they have mm -hmm. and continue to do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing. And and I just I mean, they, they have they have raped and pillaged and I mean if you really go back all the way back in history from the time that a white person has shown up in history. When we were kings and queens of nations and they were living in caves and we had to teach them how to be civilized and to wash themselves and bathe themselves and read and write. I always think about, they have, they have been recently coming out with it now of how trauma it has been passed down through generations. Oh yes. yes, yes. And I always think about how inherently like we as black people, especially as black men, just like a little simple thing of when I was a kid, I remember walking past a black man and giving the nod. I was not taught that. And I don't think any of black men was taught to nod as a, at a, or acknowledge another black man when he sees them. That is just something that was inherently passed down through bloodlines. And just like that has been done, the trauma has been passed down all the way from our ancestors. Mm -hmm. And I look at, and I say that to say, I really wish that we will be able to get to a place where us as black people understand our power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it is phenomenal. It is, it really is, it really is. As long as we That's have people that, that uh, uh, are either paid or, or their mind is so messed up that they are, they come into a situation and break it up. Uh, this, you know, we had a group here, uh, for years that was dealing with civil rights and, and candidates and everything like that. And we could meet and whatever happened. And then as years went on, we had people in the meetings <laughs> Thank on you. the phone putting whatever was going on in the meeting on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, I, I, I don't know if these young, they were young, if they didn't know any better or because they grew up in that, that kind of world they figured that they were informing, but didn't realize the meeting that was taking place in there was for the members, you know, uh, to develop strategies for certain things in order for us to, you know, get some things accomplished. But it was nothing for us to go home. And I had to back away from that group. There's nothing for us to uh, go home and see the whole meeting on Facebook. Mm, mm. Everybody said, how much money was collected. And, you know, you wouldn't see that. And so that's why I'm saying 
uh, like you're saying, Roger, you know, we have to realize how much power we have and we mm -hmm. can't give it away like that. And that's, mm -hmm. to me, that was giving away some of the power we had and, and giving out our strategies mm -hmm. to anybody, you know, who wanted to uh, use that against us. You know, you know what? <clears throat> Slim, <clears throat> I, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to exit in just a few minutes. So okay. Go, go, go ahead, Colonel. No, but uh whoever was leading that minutes uh the meeting should have shut that stuff down, got them young folks off them off that and said uh, this is a parameters. What is said in this meeting is for the people that's in this meeting and shut those folks down with the phones and stuff. Well, that, was, that, that was known. That was known. Like I said, we didn't we didn't really know until after the meeting because you could sit there like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. but right up front, saying uh, you ch it's just like you're going into a skiff, secured area. These are the parameters. Leave your phones in the car <laughs> if you have to. Mm -hmm. You can answer that emergency phone call from uh, from the girlfriend or whatever when you get out of this meeting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is it. These are what we are discussing stays in here. And if you can't do it, then don't come back. Mm -hmm. We don't need you because you are mm -hmm. counterproductive to the goals and objectives of this group and shut them down right then. <clears throat> so I'm going to go because I know you got to go. It's I have to run. I apologize. Um, uh, I, you know what? I'm using restraint now because I had another diatribe. I know you did. I know that's why, that's why I picked my cup up. I picked my cup up. <laughs> but, uh, I didn't think, Leah, to uh, when you said you had to run early to transfer and I could put it out and you know I could have uh put out the, the meeting Facebook page right well no, it's, the it's, Facebook it's, page on the zoom but I could do it and then if you left oh yeah yeah you to talk but uh that's okay that's fine you know we, we have uh, plenty other times to continue the conversation I mean this this conversation could be a 15 hour <laughs> oh you better believe it yeah, it can be a 15 hour town hall. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we will discuss this some more, but we just wanted to sort of touch on some things this being Black History Month and, uh, you know, from the host and and plus introduce uh, our guest host, Roger, uh, to our team. And we're sure he's going to be invaluable to uh, what we have to offer here. And uh, especially uh, showing that Greyhound pride. <laughs> Greyhound pride. Mm. With us celebrating the 110 years of our Greyhound's existence and yes. all the different things that are going to be coming up this year. Mm -hmm. Okay, Leah, 7... Uh, 29. Voice McCarthy Talk is here for our voice. Our community. And our future. And Roger, we're going to get you a cup, man. Okay. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, gonna out, I'm gonna figure out what my word is. <laughs> you have to add another word, or, or you know, it, it hurts my heart to to cut this short because I had so much more, like the colonel that I wanted to share, but um, I do have a commitment, and I, I must honor, I must honor that. that commitment. So, um, <clears throat> but thank you all. Thank you so very much. Thank, thank you on Facebook Live for for, for, for tuning in. And uh, this conversation continues. Yeah. To be continued. To be continued. <laughs> okay, guys, y'all have a blessed day. Thank you. Thank you. you as well. Welcome, Roger. Thank you. Welcome, my son. <laughs> <Good to be here. laughs>